What's the word, y'all? Welcome back to uh, uh, another one of those talking about every single NBA team for X amount of minutes. I know that the title says one minute, but I'm keeping it a buck with you. Every team is not getting one minute to talk about because as we get to the 60% mark of the NBA season, there are some teams that don't get a lot of eye time for me. I might watch some highlights. I might, wa might watch some possessions from players that I like on that organization. But let's be honest, man. Some, some teams are not worth watching unless you're a diehard fan of that team. And what you will see throughout this video, you will be able to tell which are the teams that I've been watching heavily versus which are the teams I have not been watching. So, yes, you did get clickbaited. My apologies, but we're trying to get new people to join the channel. Speaking of that, if you're new around here, subscribe. Leave a like. At the end of the day, I'm just a dude with a microphone and watch some basketball. You may disagree with everything I say in this video, which would be weird considering we're talking about 30 different teams, if you disagree with literally everything I say in this video, this is the only time I'm going to tell you, do not subscribe to the channel. <laughs> do not subscribe to the channel, my boy. But everybody else, even if it's one out of 30, subscribe, leave a like, let's get into it. Hey, this video was filmed an hour before the Clippers trade with the with the Trailblazers, so keep that in mind. It was also filmed before the big news that the 76ers and the Nets might be having a conversation soon. That doesn't really disrupt the video, but I'm just letting you know, once we get to those teams, they're not mentioned because of that. All right, cool. The way we're doing things is our one seed, one seed, two seed, two seed. So if for some reason you don't really care about me talking about 29 teams, you just want to listen to your favorite team, and your favorite team happen to be at the end of the conference, you can, you can fast forward if you want to, but spoiler alert, as I said, some teams get talked about less, and the lower we get down, low-key the least I'm gonna have to say because you feel me let's start off at the top of the Easter Conference right now the one seed is Chicago Bulls it's weird to say I ate hey, as a diehard Bulls fan going into the season I would have never expected that we'd be 60% of the way through the season and the Bulls will be the one seed but pretty much as of right now every question mark that uh fans or slash writers had about the Chicago Bulls when it comes to defense is true right now um we can't defend a damn thing every single night it's we're trying to outscore you you, we gonna give up a two, but we might come down and hit a three, and like that, we got the lead. And it's been hard to watch because, because I've been accustomed to now when we when we had Alice Caruso and Lonzo Ball and Derrick Jones Jr. being healthy, I was low key accustomed to the Bulls playing a little bit of defense out there. And when I try to explain to people that aren't watching the Bulls as, as as intently as I am, that those three players being out with injury matters so much, they don't really understand. Those guys are the heart and soul of the defense. If they not out there causing havoc, we will not get stops. So I would not be surprised, again, as we talk about six to eight weeks of those guys being injured, if this team who is the one seed right now slid down to the four or slid down to the five, considering how bunched up they are. And this makes me think about basically what I'm thinking about about all 30 NBA teams because we're in the dog days of the NBA season. I'm just counting nine days to the trade deadline. And my mind immediately thinks of, what will the front office do come trade that line? And I've listened to a lot of different podcasts of people that are really in tune with the game of basketball as far as like knowing people around the league that are sources. They say that the Bulls don't want to trade Patrick Williams. Okay, so if we're not trading Patrick Williams and you believe that we could go out and win a championship, what moves do we do? Because right now, based on what we've seen, this is not a team that is ready. Right. So I don't I don't really know what they do again. I'm just enjoying the fact that we are playing OK basketball because we haven't had that in half a decade. But I'm very curious of what they do. Get well soon to the rest of the guys. I was on TNT talking about the Bulls for two minutes. That was fun. Talk about the Phoenix Suns, because as of right now, the Phoenix Suns are 41 and 10 crazy. They lost their last game to the Atlanta Hawks. But other than that, they're great. Um, and, and when I ask people, and there are some places I've talked about this before, there are some places where I try not to talk about basketball, but I'm always curious about the casual fans and I, again casual is not a negative connotation in my world if you if you're a casual fan that's okay um the casual fans perceptation of the nba slash who will win a championship slash who will win a conference and when i ask people who do you have coming out the west or who do you have winning the championship the suns don't get as much love as i think they should a lot of people go to the Warriors, which makes sense because the Warriors are great in themselves a lot of people think that the bucks are gonna repeat which makes sense they're great in themselves a lot of people still see the brooklyn nets which is great but i very rarely hear people say the suns and in my mind they should be getting a lot more love because there's not many holes that you can poke in this team. They have stoppers. They have a floor general point guard who's one of the greatest to ever do it. They have Devin Booker who has improved every single year. I know Kenny, his field guard percentage is down. His points or his uh, percentage on two-pointers is down. He's getting better every single season. They got a three-man a center rotation that looks like the greatest of all time. And a lot of that goes to Chris Paul. They are greatly coached and they just have good role players. And they're the greatest clutch team in the entire NBA. And when I think about basketball, specifically playoff basketball, basketball i want the clutchest team 
this is a game that's going to get slowed down. So I'm not saying I would pick the Phoenix Suns to win a championship, but when I ask people, I would expect people to say the Phoenix Suns more than some of these other teams. Um, but I'm just enjoying watching them play every night. The Miami Heat. Man, again, every single team has dealt with injuries for sure. So I'm not trying to single out the Miami Heat or even the Bulls like I did a couple minutes ago. Every single team have went through their ups and downs when it came to health and safety protocol injuries. But we're talking about a team that missed Kyle Lowry for a significant amount of time. Bam Adebayo missed over a month of basketball. Jimmy Butler has been in and out of the rotation. But here they are tied for the one seed. And low-key, by the end of the night, they might be the one seed because the Bulls are playing a second game of a back-to-back. And last night, they went to overtime and lost. So they might have them dead legs. The Miami Heat are so very good right now and it's not surprising that they're good it's surprising that they've been able to be this good considering all the things that they've been through and I try to consume a lot of NBA ball because as much as I try to watch I can't get everything there are some things that are even higher level for me to even understand in the game of basketball so I try to read as much as I can or try to listen to as many podcasts as I can and there's a one Twitter follow that I highly recommend I recommend listening or listening to him on his podcast and I recommend reading um, reading his articles and I, my apologies if I pronounce is wrong because he has a pronunciation in his name but i'm so wrong with letters or so bad with letters nikaius duncan some of y'all already know him he's got like fifty thousand followers on twitter he's a very good follow and i was listening to him on a podcast with kevin o'connor and he was he's very in tune with the miami heat specifically and he was basically talking about how the miami heat have been able to change the way they play basketball depending on who's available that night which is crazy because every single NBA team can't really do that. They have smart players. They have one of the greatest coaches in the league. It's weird to say that Eric Spoelstra has never won a coach of the year, but he hasn't. And I think a lot of that has to do with like early in his career, similar to like Steve Kerr. And we'll talk about them in a couple minutes, how when you start off your NBA career as a coach and you already have legendary players slash big threes, people question how much is coaching versus how much is the players. And I think that the, the coaches get uh, devalued to the to the average NBA fan when in reality Eric Spoelstra is just one of the greatest to do it and he might be the best doing it right now. I'm low-key fearing that he going to bring out that zone and the Bulls won't score for five minutes at a time. You know, he's been they've been able to find two way player size players that were there were scraps on other teams and have them be good. Max Struess or Caleb Martin or Gabe Vincent. And they've just been able to do things. And they're a fun team to watch offensively and defensively. And for the first time in a while, they have all three of their star players playing and they won last night. The Warriors are currently on an eight game win streak without Draymond Green. They are looking good. Klay Thompson is looking better and better. I think last night he hit six threes in the first half. Now, the second half, he didn't really do much after that. But he hit like six threes in the first half and then he's looking better and better they've been able to keep the streak alive without Draymond which is promising um, because we don't really know what's going on with Draymond he announced yesterday that he won't be able to participate in the all-star game so that's two weeks away and he's already said no to that so we don't know what's going on with Draymond Green but they've been able to weather the storm that's Steph Curry who's looking better and better low-key that slump might be over we'll see it's only been like three games so I'm not saying it's completely over but he's looking better and better but my question similar to what I said about the Bulls is what do they do with the trade deadline because again as good as they are and they can win a championship and a lot of people see them as the favorite which is good they're not unmess winnable and you know what i really want to say but we're gonna keep it pg they're not unmess winnable and they have some players on their team that might be tradable pieces to to improve i i don't think bob myers has been a dude that's made in-season trades other than the d'angelo russell trade when they weren't very good but as they look like contenders bob myers and the front office of the Warriors have never been a team that's gonna be like oh we're one piece away but could they do it this year the 76ers three seed I mean the Eastern Conference in itself one game can drop you from the one seed to the five seed low key depending on what the rest of the league is up to so it's, it's kind of scary being a part of this but hey it's also fun as an NBA fan um the 76ers are 31 and 20 um lost their last game to the Wizards if I'm not mistaken but the game before that was a thriller Tyrese Maxi yada 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 um my main concern about the 76ers is will they be disappointing fans if they decide not to trade Ben Simmons this week. Um, and I know that Daryl Morey in the front office have have tried to tamper the expectations. Hey, we are okay with, with not trading Ben because we think that we can get James Hard in this offseason. I, if I was a 76 fan, I would low-key be disappointed in not trading Ben Simmons as his deadline. Joel Embiid could be the MVP of the league this season, even with him playing in the MVP level. I, I personally, and th this could change throughout the course of the season, I still don't see them in the upper echelon of contenders too because it is so much Joel Embiid and it's just like good to solid role players slash good players around him when in reality, I mean, I don't know. I, I just don't know. Is this, I know they said they, they don't want to waste a Joel Embiid year. Is this considered wasting a Joel Embiid year if you don't trade Ben Simmons for asset? Those Grizzlies, man, those Grizzlies. 
Jaron Jackson Jr., unfortunately for him, it took him a while to get to the point where he's at right now. Because of that, he wasn't really in all-star conversations. But as of recently, whether it be the last month or two, he's been playing all-star caliber. It's so crazy. I went back to look at this. Um, through the first 14 games of the season, they were 7-7. Seven and seven, And they had the worst defense in the entire league. Right now, let me let me go ahead and click over to my other tab. Uh, they are 36-18. and 18. They went like 25 games. And lost four of them at one point. That is now currently they're six and four in the last ten. But either way, that is insane. And right now they went from the worst defense in the league to a team that's teetering around seven to ten. One game can turn you from the seven to the ten. It's kind of weird in the NBA right now. But it's just a testament to, to I, I don't know actually. I literally don't, what happened? What what was the the flick switching? Or even there might not have been a flick switch. I was listening to the Low Post the other day in one of my favorite podcasts, and he had a couple guests on who sounded very similar. So I don't know if it was Bobby Marks or the other guy, but they said that they still have the Bucks as the favorite in Eastern Conference because they're they're working with this different kind of swagger, which I can low key agree with. The fact that the, they lost a game, and I forget what it was that Cleveland. They lost a game in Cleveland. They got smoked in Cleveland, and then in a post game interview, Giannis came up with some some chicken and chicken wings and said, "Hey, we suck." You know, I think they just have a different mindset when it comes to the regular season. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Is that is that <laughs> championship fatigue already? I don't really know. But they're still really, really good when the best three of the team, uh, best three of the players play. And I know recently, again, they lost to the Cavs with all three. And I think they lost to the Nuggets by 30 with all three. For the most part, they have been virtually unstoppable with all three. You think about net rating and how good the offense and the defense is. I still am a bit afraid of what Brooke Lopez's injury is or or would they be able to trade Dante DiVincenzo to just bolster up that front court? I don't really know because it feels like Dante's um, Dante's trade value might not be as high as it was when they were getting Bogdanovich a couple seasons ago. But there, I feel like there are going to be centers on the market. And I think we're going to talk about this a little bit when we get to the Hornets. Centers on the market that won't cost a ton that could raise your floor. And, and I think the Bucs should be trying to go after one of those guys. The Utah Jazz are bad right now. And a lot of that, again, Rudy Gobert missed significant time. Donovan Mitchell has missed significant time. He just got out of um, – I'm so used to now protocol – just automatically being health and safety, but Donovan Mitchell just got a concussion protocol. And Brian Windhorst said um, today or, or late yesterday, Gobert and Mitchell have been at each other's, I don't know if I can say it, other th throats. Oh, my God. Brian Windhorst is saying that Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert ha are back to having a passively aggressive, awkward relationship. And that was McMiniman, McMahon. I, I can't read. Um, and that is... Interesting. There was also reports a couple weeks ago that was like, hey, Donald Mitchell's won um, one first round exit away from requesting the trade. And again, these are all rumors. I don't know if when Horse is just talking out his ass. I don't know. But it's interesting for the league, ladies and gentlemen. Rudy Gobert said two weeks ago, um, I look at the way, uh, what do you say? I look at the way Devin Booker has tied in on the defensive side of the ball and yada yada. That is a real life shot at Donovan Mitchell that he's talking about Devin Booker's defense when these dudes have been compared for each other for the last three seasons. The team hasn't been great. They've been missing their top two players. Joe Wingles just tore his ACL. If this was happening on a team that was like one of the top markets in the NBA, it'd be all over the place. But they're in Utah, so it's low key. Could this be the last year that we see these two players play together? Maybe. The Cavaliers, man. I, I legit think that Jared Allen should have been an all-star over Chris Middleton. Hey, it is what it is. Um, there have been a team that that has thrived in beating badass teams. Or like, when we're going against a team that is worse than us, we will win those games. And that is how you get to the playoffs. And that is how you get a top seed. You don't play down in competition. And once you play against the good people, you have a chance. And they played against the good people in the Bucks. Bust their ass. But the last couple losses for them have been bad. It have not been very Cleveland Cavaliers-like. I think it was the Rockets and the Detroit Pistons. And the Detroit Pistons, when they blew a big lead. Um, but regardless, I'm still impressed with the way they've been able to do what they do, considering Colin Sexton being out. Ricky Rubio was looking like their third to fourth best player majority of the season. He is also out. Um, Larry Marketing is now out. They have not had the injury luck like a lot of teams, but I feel like theirs might be more significant than the average team considering the roles that the players were playing and they still been good, man. DZ being an all-star game in Cleveland is going to be great. I can't wait to be there and they, he gets announced or you know what? Actually, this is this is what I've learned in the last couple years of me being at the all-star game. The average fan of that that organization gets priced out of the all-star game tickets 
So I was going to say when Darius Garland gets announced to come into the game, yeah, there's going to be an uproar, but it won't be as big of an uproar as you expect because the average NBA fan can't pay $1,500, $2,000 to just go to this exhibition game. I'll root for him like, like he's a hometown dude. But, yeah, it's unfortunate. But that's I guess that's the way things work. Shouldn't. But, hey, the Mavericks. Hey, listen, I'm a guy. I'm a guy that can say he's wrong when he was wrong. And I was wrong about Jason Kidd's defensive schemes. Earlier in the season, I was talking about how I don't love it. When I was watching, they were blitzing every single thing. They were blitzing Davion Mitchell, who at that point was shooting 20% from three on the season. They were blitzing, 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 and letting him pick and roll with Rashawn Holmes. And I was, what the hell are they doing? And recently, the scheme has been working. They're one of the best defensive teams in the entire league. Um, Luka Doncic is playing back up to Luka Doncic standards. And I know the count of stats have always been there. But he looks more fit now than he did in the early stages of the season. I know he just lost a bad one to OKC without Shea Gilles Alexander. But regardless, I was wrong. But they're still missing something. And I don't think they're going to be able to get that something. But they're still missing something for me to put them on the next level. But again, when Luka's playing good basketball, he is must-see TV. The Nets. There's a lot of turmoil going on with the Brooklyn Nets right now. KD posted a picture on Instagram. And you know what? I'm going to see if I can find it real quick because I was low-key surprised. Now, again, we are, um, as NBA fans... We overreact to literally everything. I'm not exaggerating. Kevin Durant was listening to a song and posted it on Instagram. And here I am trying to dissect what the hell he said. Hold on. Let me find it. He was listening to a song by Huey Brisk and Nico Beats called Losing My Faith. Hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, what is he talking about? Um, but no, they're they're having things said and just it just hasn't been looking great with the with the heart of rumors going around and him the other night having literally his worst game almost ever. Um, and he, he he talked about his post game interview just having distractions, and then Kyrie said hopefully one day we'll all be able to play together. We and like the self awareness just wasn't th for a team that is still according to Vegas the the favorite to win a championship. They don't look like it now when all three of them are playing. It's a different story, but you're only getting half of that when everybody's healthy, if everybody gets healthy at the same time. They've been together for a season and a half. They have like 17 games under their belt together. You know what I'm saying? And if things don't work out, if they don't win a championship and James Harden moves to his next team or Kyrie moves to his next team because he wants to play, to a, play in a place where he doesn't need to get the shot, some of these trades we're going to look back on and be like, damn, the Nets did it again. The Nets did it again. I, and listen, in the moment, if you can trade for James Harden and you can sign KD and Kyrie, you do it 99 times out of 100. But I don't think they thought a global pandemic was going to hit, prevent them from having one of their top three players play. Um, and I don't think they expected James Harden to not look like the 100% version of himself. He's still an all-star. You saw that the other night. He's still an all-star caliber player. I won't refute that. But he still doesn't look like the James Harden that was dogging the league and won an MVP just a couple of seasons ago. What can I say about the Nuggets other than they are, um, not they are great. <laughs> Jokic is great. And you know what? I, I saw a screenshot on Twitter and it was the, um, oh my God, what is the podcast with, I can't think of the name of the podcast. Um, all the smoke, all the smoke with Matt Barnes and, and Steven Jackson. And they were ranking their MVPs and none of them had Jokic on the ballot. And, and peep, there's a stigma around the league of people that, that think that Jokic is an MVP caliber player as nerds. Everybody that show love to Jokic is a nerd. They only talk about advanced stats and graphs. No, motherfucker, you're just not watching the games. That just tells me everything I need to know. If you don't have Jokic in your MVP conversation, I'm not saying he should be the winner right now because I don't have a vote and we're only 60% of the way through the season. But if you're going through the top three, top four MVP candidates and Jokic is not on my list, I just know you're not watching their games, which is fine. But don't try to discredit my ballot because I got Jokic there. Simple. The Raptors. Hey, the Raptors are, if you look at their... um. Offensive defensive stats, they're average at literally everything. They're average defensive team, they're average offensive teams. But when I watch them, I feel like their defense should be a lot better than average when it comes to the advanced stats because when they run that lineup of, of Scotty, Gary Trent Jr., who's like leading the league in deflections and steals, Pascal, OG, and um Pascal and Scotty Barnes. I'm like, who am I forgetting? Scotty Barnes. They got like hands out of this world. They're deflecting every pass. They're playing great defense. Uh, my question to them is what do they do at the trade deadline? Because even though they've been looking better and better, 
they still only have like a six man rotation of players that can legitimately play NBA minutes on a team that's solid. So will they be able to move Gordon Dragic at this trade deadline? I don't know because he's still making like eighteen million dollars. I don't know if a team is gonna take that. You basically, I saw a report that if a team did trade for Gordon Dragic, they'd buy him out. I'm so very happy for Car Anthony Towns making another All Star appearance. A couple years ago, um, every GM across the league was asked if you were to start an NBA organization, who would be the guy you want to start off with? And Car Anthony Towns had a vast majority of those votes. And every single season, it went down and down and down. It got to the point where people were calling Car Anthony Towns soft, and he wasn't a great NBA center anymore. And here he is getting back to All Star caliber. Um, and a lot of that has to do with his team winning more games. At the end of the day, I mean, his stats is pretty much the same over the past couple seasons, but he is winning more games. And I would say that his defense is better this season than any of the other seasons and I saw somebody on Twitter and this is not a shot at you my boy if you're watching this video definitely not a shot I'm just talking about the Minnesota Timberwolves right now and in yesterday's video I was talking about the NBA All-Star game and we were talking about snubs and in that video I was basically saying like there's not a lot of there's not a lot of snubs and, and bro hit me and like hey Anthony Edwards is a snub and though Anthony Edwards has been great this season I think we got to stop using the word snub so loosely and the reason I am saying that is because if you're trying to tell me X player is a snub, I just got a report from from old. Sorry, if you're telling me that X player is a snub, you gotta also tell me who he should replace. And if you can't do that, then player X is not a snub. In my mind, snub is a player that should have been in there and deserved it over the player that actually wasn't there. Lamelo Ball legitimately might be a snub. Anthony Edwards, I don't really see him as snub, even though he has been playing All Star caliber. I just don't think he's he's been better. Than the other players that actually made it. That, that's my only thing. That's my only thing. Shout out to Ant though. He's he's amazing. The Charlotte Hornets. Let's talk about it, man. Um, the big thing about the Charlotte Hornets that everybody has been talking about is their lack of center depth slash lack of good center to to put this team over the top. What does over the top mean? I think over the top means that not in the play in. And right now they're four and a half games out of the first seed. They lost their last two. Lamelo Ball had a career night the other night. It was great, but they end up losing to the Boston Celtics. So we'll talk about in a couple teams. Um, but this is the thing. If they want to upgrade that position, I just don't think they have that great of a package to do it. I, I thought that James Booknight, because he looks like a baby, I, for some reason, thought he was like 19. He's 21. He spent two years at college. I don't know why. I thought he was 19. He's 21, which is not a bad thing. <laughs> it's not a bad thing, but I just thought that he was he he was 19 years old. That's all. Um, And the package is, is, is not enticing if you're not throwing Booknight in there. Book Knight, when he's got minutes, he's looked okay. He's looked like a good slash good potential player. But I've also seen Hornets fans say they're not willing to give up Book Knight. So what the hell are you giving up to upgrade that center position? There are a lot of centers that might be on the market. The Washington Wizards have three centers over there that I don't think they care about any of them. As far as like they're answering phones for Thomas Bryant. They're answering phones for, for Montrez and they're answering phones from Daniel Gafford. I just don't know what your package looks like. Clippers last night played one of the best games of the season. Now they were blowing a lead and low-key low clustered out with Reggie Jackson. And that screenshot of Reggie Jackson going around Twitter right now is hilarious. But I mentioned this a couple of videos ago, how they they just remind me of like a good mid-major college, bro, where you just legitimately don't know if it's going to be a Reggie Jackson night. You don't know if it's going to be Mook. You don't know if it's going to be anybody else. Terrence Mann can surprisingly drop a 20-piece out of nowhere. Amir Kofi could drop 20. Luke Kennard can hit six threes in the game. And because of that, they're hard to game plan against. And I, I think after the game last night, Teron Liu, um went to his post-game interview and was like, we're prepared to not get um, not get Kawhi Leonard back this season. Which is disappointing, man. I miss watching Kawhi play basketball. Regardless, them sitting at 500 is is really impressive considering the lack of upper end talent that they have. The Celtics, man, I had told myself or told y'all that I would not talk about the Celtics anymore because every time I talk about the Celtics, they go on a five game losing streak. But here we go, we're testing the Kenny. Um, what is it? The Kenny curse? The Kenny for real curse? Either way, in the last ten games, they are seven and three. The defense has been spectacular, even though their upper end talent, Jason Tatum, might not be having the same season statistically as some of the other seasons. He's still been a height. Um, and and they're slowly creeping their way out of the not in the playoff thing. <laughs> Them and the Atlanta Hawks, who we'll talk about, found a way in the early stages of the second half of the season to be good again. And a lot of that for the Boston Celtics is they were hanging their hat on the defensive side of the ball. Um, but I also saw a rumor the other day about the Chicago Bulls and Dennis Schroeder which is very interesting. I don't know what that package looks like, and I'm not really interested in Dennis Schroeder as a player for the Bulls, but I don't know what we would give you other than, like, the fle the cap flexibility to get under the luxury tax for that trade. To I don't know. Shout out to the C's, though. The Lakers, whoo. Um, three games under 500. 
They've missed Anthony Davis to a good point. He's come back. He's looked really, really good since he's come back, which is a great sign because eventually LeBron will come back from his injury. We don't know when that will be. LeBron and, and his team has always been a, a, a team to slow roll these injuries where, like, they'll tell you he's day-to-day, and then it'll turn into a week, and they're like, oh, actually, it's going to be two more weeks. You know what I'm saying? They slow roll these things. And I saw a picture um, in a video on Twitter about there being a, a sack of liquid in the back of LeBron's left leg or left knee. And that doesn't sound great. <laughs> that doesn't sound great. So I hope Bron comes back sooner rather than later, not as a Laker fan, but as a fan of the NBA, considering how good he was. And I just want to see their entire team healthy for the first time. The Atlanta Hawks are 8-2 and two in their last 10 games. They just beat the best team in basketball. And Trey Young's offense, these, I'm just literally reading my notes. Trey Young offense, Trey Young's offense is, as far as a heliocentric offensive player there's not many in the entire league that are better now the other side of the ball prevents him from being a top five ish or whatever but we're strictly talking about the offensive side of the ball trey young as an orchestrator is is elite and we talk about a dude that low-key like six foot maybe lower i met trey young dog and he ain't, he ain't really feel like he was six foot six one like they be trying to advertise him as. You feel me? Um, but this is another year where they seem like they might turn a flip a switch on the second half of the season, which is not good. You shouldn't start every season ass and then start to play good and then find yourself as the five seed or the six seed or whatever four seed. If you could just play consistently solid for the entire season, there's nothing to worry about. Um, but hey, I guess better late than never. The Blazers better be active at the deadline, or I'm going to be upset with them. Simple. They, be, they better be active. I'm not I'm not telling them who they should trade or they should trade Dame or they should trade CJ. If they don't make a minimum of three trades, I'm going to be disappointed. Unless one of those trades, they make one trade that's about a boom, about a bam. Then I won't be disappointed. But they just got to make some moves. I'm, I don't really know what direction they're going to go in as far as trying to get youth in or are they trying to buy for when Dame comes back at the end of the season or, or next season. I don't really know the direction, but you got to make a, a decision. The Wizards, the vibes aren't great, y'all. The vibes are not great. Talk about a team that was the one seed. Everybody said this before. They the one seed very early in the season. Uh, Dinwiddie has to be moved for the lowest, will be moved for the lowest, seems like, because uh, him and Bradley Beal are butting heads. And you're you're picking Bradley Beal for the Washington Wizards. You can't have anybody in there that's going to butt heads with him. But the problem is Dinwiddie got paid a, a decent amount of money, for sure. And I don't know if teams are looking at what he's done this season, even though he had a triple-double against the, the 76ers didn't night. I don't know if many teams are looking at what Spencer Dinwiddie has done this season and his price tag and think, like, yeah, that's worth it. You know what I'm saying? They're worth it. Every single player should be up for trade for them. Not a single player should be untouchable. Not one of them. Not one of them. The vibes aren't great. And if they don't make trades similar to what I said with the, uh, the uh, Trailblazers, I'm disappointed. But, again, I'm just a guy that wants to see um, craziness happen. So, make trades. The Pelicans are a half a game out of the play-in. And with the Trailblazers potentially making some trades, the Pelicans might be a play-in team this season. Which is crazy because they're 19-32 and 32 and they still trying to tell the fans that Zion will come back. Zion will come back. If they can just win a couple in a row, boom, you're a play-in team. And then Zion comes back, boom. I, I, don't, I don't really have much to say about the Pelicans. I really like Herb Jones and Brandon Ingram is a stud and that, that's all. It's talking about the vibes being off. According to Reddit, now I didn't fact check this myself because I just feel like it's the people that are out there that go through the following of NBA players slash celebrities to see who unfollowed who is kind of weird to me. Like uh, Drake unfollowed Rihanna and ASAP Rocky after they announced they're having a baby. Who the hell was like, Rihanna's having a baby. Let me go think of, see what Drake is up to. You know what I'm saying? Recently, somebody looked through Julius Randle's Twitter followed. And he unfollowed the New York Knicks, and now people are speculating. Does he know that the trade is coming up in these last couple days? The Vabs have not been great with Julius Randle. He has not talked to the reporters at the end of games in the past. I don't think he's done it at all in 2022. He goes through these games. He goes through the motions. He hasn't played great, and he doesn't talk to, to the media. Ah, All NBA second team last year, y'all. Not even in consideration for an all-star appearance this season. Ah, uh, and now we get down to our last group of teams, and we might be able to rapid fire some of these low key. Uh, the Spurs might have DeJounte Murray as an all star replacement, and I talked about this yesterday. I hope he gets it, but if the NBA wants to stay consistent with what the hell they've been trying to tell us for a decade or two, two, uh, two guards, three forwards, and then two wild cards off the bench, they should be replacing Draymond with the forward, which might be Brandon Ingram. But if they go with DeJounte Murray, then Adam Silver got to make those changes. DeJounte Murray deserves to be in there. 
as a replacement. But if he's not, then I can't even be mad because that's just them sticking to their guns. Um, the Pacers played a guy named Terry Taylor. Didn't even know he existed. And bro balled the fuck. He balled out. I saw his stat line. I was like, oh, is that a center? Bro, it's six five. He had like 15 rebounds, y'all. I don't know if they got something in Terry Taylor because that was the only time I ever seen a stat line from him. Um, but I like that they playing the younger dudes. You know what I'm saying? See what the heck is going on. Lance Stevenson just got extended or got a full-time contract, which is great for him. But I ain't got nothing to say about the Pacers until they make a trade. I ain't got much to say about the Kings until they make a trade. No, um, Davion Mitchell of the past couple games have been really exciting, bro. He had the game against the Warriors where he played great defense on – nope, nope, no. He had the game against the Nets where he played great defense on a combination of James Harden slash Kyrie Irving. And then against the Warriors the other night, he had 21 points going into halftime. Davion Mitchell getting better and better, which is a good thing. That's a very good thing. That makes – maybe make it a, a Reese or maybe a trade in uh, De'Aaron Fox. A little less hard on them if they believe that Davion Mitchell could continue this little run he's on. Kay Cunningham recently took over the NBA Ladders Rookie of the Year. Shout out to him. I be trying to explain to people that the Rookie of the Year award literally means nothing at all um, other than like I had a good rookie season. That does That's not a way to tell who's going to be the best prospect of the top guys in the draft class. We've seen in, uh, night in, night out of a rookie having a great rookie season, not being great. I'm not foreshadowing that for Cade or anybody else associated. But anytime I make a tweet about Cade or I make a tweet about Scotty or I make a tweet about Mobley, there's people coming in from the other camps like just being being salty about the thing. When in reality, the Rookie of the Year award doesn't mean a damn thing. It just doesn't. Just respect all, all of the guys as rookies in hoop. And, bro, this class has been incredible. Um, the Thunder, speaking of this rookie class, you had the moment with Josh Giddy to add a Kenridge Williams. And again, Kenridge Williams, please become a Chicago Bull, please. Um, but I, my notes for the OKC Thunder says more first round picks, question mark? Next, the Orlando, Ma <laughs> the Orlando Magic are a fun team for them being the worst team in basketball. And then lastly, the Houston Rockets. Um, my notes say last eight games, Kevin Porter Jr., 17 points, seven and a half assists, and only three turnovers. Right. Considering early in the season, it didn't look like he can really hold the primary playmaker uh, role. That is me talking about every single NBA team for um, X amount of time. Some got three seconds. Some got three minutes. I don't really know. If you enjoyed the video, leave it a like, and we will do this again at the end of the season. But it won't be every team. It will be every playoff team. I appreciate y'all. Peace.